Religion, a mysterious human phenomenon. Most anthropologists now believe that it is a cultural universal, meaning that every human society has some form of it. A fact that, if true, is incredibly interesting, especially with regards to the ethical sphere, given how morality and religion have been historically intertwined. To explain why religion has been so pervasive, some may say that we are biologically geared towards it. Others could hypothesize that all cultures without it died out, because they could not form a functioning society. In this video we do something a bit different. We propose a utilitarian interpretation of religion. That is, we conjecture that, in the early days of civilization, religion could have been created to function as a powerful utilitarian instrument. In the sense that religion could have been engineered as a scheme with the goal of increasing human well-being by forming the backbone of a primordial human society. Let's see if we can draw a compelling picture. The Rules and Precepts Many have argued that all religions could be different sides of the same coin, or be paths that lead in the same direction. Just to name a few, Aldous Huxley, the Dalai Lama, and Joseph Campbell have all in some shape or form married this thesis. But some, like Stephen Prothero, remain unconvinced. Based on the fact that religions have different mythologies, practices, rituals, and doctrines, Prothero sees too many dissimilarities between religions to make them a monolithic entity. Though there does seem to be an area of agreement that all religions try to ethically guide mankind in a relatively similar manner. They frown upon killing and stealing, they establish guidelines and precepts for what is good, and many develop similar versions of the golden rule. We believe they also converge on the ultimate goal of their norms, increasing human well-being. Indeed, in our view, the norms are purposefully selected to, on average, produce positive utility. Take the rule to not steal. There are cases in which refraining from stealing could bring suffering. For example, if a thief was taking food for his starving children. But in the great majority of cases, not stealing leads to happier outcomes. Under our interpretation, since such a rule would be thought to, on average, increase happiness, it would be promoted by religious texts. From the nonviolent tenets of the Hindus and the Ten Commandments of the Christians to the focus on reducing suffering of Buddhism, many religious precepts can be straightforwardly encompassed by this paradigm. But if what we are saying is true, why the differences between religious teachings? And more importantly, why do some religious norms seem unrelated or counterproductive to the maximization of happiness? Well, having the objective to maximize happiness and actually maximizing happiness are two different things. People disagree on what rules increase happiness or even on how strict the rules should be, and that is reflected in the diversity of religious doctrines. While the absurdness of some tenets can be due to the times in which they were devised. Take the passage in Leviticus that condemns eating shellfish. One of the possible reasons for this prohibition is that shellfish are hard to store correctly in desert climates, and they are particularly prone to cause food poisoning, while fish were easier to salt uniformly. Even today, with our modern technology, 61% of all seafood infection outbreaks are due to shellfish. Another reason for this ban could be the will of the writers to differentiate Christianity from neighboring religions. If one believes his norms are better for the purposes of promoting happiness, it makes sense to want to stand out. So this apparently obscure tenant may be traced back to utilitarian reasons. As can, for example, the practice of performing circumcision. It was probably believed that it would make the male genitalia cleaner, improving the well-being of the believer throughout his life. Similarly, the teachings regarding the moderation and repression of sexual acts could be tied to utilitarian reasons by supposing they were a way to deal with sexually transmitted infections and curb human over-reliance on biological instincts. For us, one can view all religious teachings under this light. 
But let's again stress that this does not mean that all religious norms actually produced happiness, just that the creators thought that they did. For example, the repression of homosexuals, advocated for in some, but not all, religions, appears to produce nothing but suffering. Its inclusion in the tenets could have been due to an erroneous belief that homosexuality was a disease and that it could be spread, reflecting the limited information the human creators possessed. The Rituals A feature of most, if not all, religious traditions Rituals can be described as a pattern of behaviour with an aim, the success of which is thought to depend to some extent on the correctness of the procedure. Rituals vary greatly between religions, and may at first glance appear as arbitrary acts of devotion towards a powerful god. Is it possible for them to have a utilitarian function? Well, rituals often act as a moment of bonding, a pro-social habit that creates a sense of community, but that can also have additional uses. Marriage signals that a monogamous couple is born, and gives notice to the rest of society. In antiquity, this was an effective way of conveying information. Many rituals share this quality, such as coming-of-age rituals or funerals. Spreading these kinds of details helps a society function better and signals to the participants what roles they can fill in the community, and who is available to fill them. Other religious ceremonies, like liturgy, had the purpose of orally repeating the rules, keeping them fresh in the minds of the believers, and acted as a reminder to be on your best behaviour. The invention of prayers and meditating practices could have been developed with the goal of placating human instincts, attempts to calm the mind so as to not perform rash decisions. Indeed, most modern empirical evidence seems to point in the direction that religion is associated with self-control and reduced criminal activity. The pro-social, pro-self-disciplined nature of religious rituals could play a role in explaining this phenomenon. On the other hand, some rituals appear at first sight to be harder to place in the utilitarian-motivated paradigm such as sacrifices, divinations, and exorcisms. But again, one has to take into account the times in which they were devised. Such rituals appear as likely byproducts of apophenia, the human tendency to perceive meaningful connections between unrelated things. The practices were thought to bring favourable outcomes and prosperity, so they were conceivably motivated by a utilitarian reason. Ultimately, though, we know they were wasting resources, causing negative utility. The Myths Myths are sacred or important stories that represent extraordinary circumstances, often tied to the supernatural. One of their utilitarian purposes could have been that of motivating rituals, but there are other candidates. Myths could have provided an archaic form of education, they induce reflection on the themes and the messages contained inside them, and introduce the listener to the idea of religion. They reinforce rule-abiding behaviour and promote virtues and values by exploring complex ideas such as delayed gratification, self-control, and patience. Moreover, they provide explanations for natural phenomenons, and in doing so, they could increase the capacity of a man to cope with the apparently random and inexplicable nature of a world he inhabits. Aspects of religious myth, like the idea that there is a greater meaning to everything, seem to be positively associated with being able to manage life stresses and traumatic events. The supernatural elements might have been inserted to assign an aura of authority to the myths, and to compel the listeners to convert and obey the norms. In Abrahamic religions, the idea of a powerful god that is watching over you and sees if you infringe on the rules could have been a strong incentive to behave lawfully in societies in which law enforcement was scarce, and crimes could be committed in secret with relative ease. The allegorical nature of some myths and the self-contradictions present in religious texts might have been inserted intentionally to allow a wide array of interpretations, leaving some wiggle room to update the rules. 
In fact, it's possible that most religious writers understood that the rules would need modernizing with the passing of time, and thus needed some ambiguity to allow for a reinterpretation. This could even cause additional augmentations to the divine texts. Looking at you, the New Testament. Finally, myths were also meant to be entertaining, so the believers themselves would be enticed to listen to them happily, and then spread them, an aspect that most modern religions seem to have abandoned. The Place of Worship The Place of Worship acted as a repository for the norms, and as a physical presence on the territory where people could congregate. The aim was to convert as most people as possible to your religion, with the belief that the more people were following the rules, the more utility was produced. In addition, the church granted asylum to those who seeked it, and had the job of maintaining the local social structure intact. Okay, so on the whole, religion could have been an ambitious project with the aim of forming a structure in societies through rules and rituals, all with the objective to ameliorate the human condition. We have only sketched this picture, and at the end of the day, this is just a curious interpretation. But if it were to be true, it does lead to some amusing observations. First, if this reading of religion is true, many, if not all of its creators, could have inserted the divine elements to grip the listeners while never believing in the supernatural stories themselves. Furthermore, because in ancient times most of human efforts were dedicated to day-to-day -day survival, and few could have the time and resources to reason on moral issues, a set of clear rules given with authority could have indeed been the best utilitarian solution to prosper at the time, even if one had to use some deception to get people to adopt them. Maybe every human civilization needed to employ this stratagem to form a function in society. Nowadays, things are quite different. Under this hypothesis, one would amusingly be left to wonder what the creators would think the role of religion should be today. If modern religions accepted this possibility entirely, they would probably have to update many of their teachings. Second interesting point. Religious conflict would be in part motivated by the fact that each religion thought it had devised the system that increased utility the most and by the idea that a uniformity of laws would be the better outcome in regards to maximizing human happiness. Lastly, this interpretation would strengthen a hypothesis we have already discussed on this channel, that of human morality being descriptively tied to utilitarianism way before the first formalizations of the utilitarian theory. More precisely, when policy has to be decided, that is the moment when reason and morality come together, and empirically we believe we observe societal norms being produced cross-culturally that are inspired by the utilitarian principle. The reading of religion we have given fits nicely with this hypothesis. What is more archetypically utilitarian than a lie told for the greater good? Okay, but after these considerations, we may also be left with a question. If these supposed engineers of religion were making utilitarian calculations, couldn't they have simply taught utilitarianism directly instead? Was there really a need for a ruse? Hmm. As a starter, we wouldn't presume that the creators had a fully-fledged utilitarian theory to teach, more naively that when confronted with a human condition, their moral compass combined with a reasoned approach would naturally guide them towards utilitarian-type norms. Furthermore, as we know, utilitarian calculations can be complex and prone to misinterpretation. A frequent error is that to not consider the rule erosion component in the outcomes of an action. Some prerequisites are needed to teach them properly to a newcomer, like the ability to reason logically. Considering it was a luxury to even learn how to write for most people in ancient times, direct utilitarian teachings would probably not be cost-effective. In addition, we know that the great majority of times, utilitarianism tells us to act in accordance with societal rules. Rules simplify all the complexity of the utilitarian framework. 
They are direct and easy to understand, and one just has to abide by them to produce positive utility on average. A straightforward solution aimed at people who had less time to ponder than some of us have today. Regarding the pervasiveness of a supernatural element, our reading does not exclude that maybe the creators did believe in them to an extent, and could have very well believed that the utilitarian precepts they were writing were inspired by a greater god themselves. Great, now this is not the only interpretation of religion available. Another, maybe more common interpretation of religion is that it was created not for the good of everyone, but for the good of a few. An instrument of power born to control people and enrich the higher ranking members of the church. A way to subjugate the masses, a monument to self-interest. This could very well be true. Of course, we do not claim to have found the truth on the matter. Probably elements of both interpretations could have some validity. Maybe at its origin, our interpretation could fit the picture better, and then, with the passing of time, the other could hold more veracity. We will talk more about specific aspects of religion in future videos.